Okay, so I am just delighted to be here with you all tonight, and thank you, Samantha, for that very generous introduction. Uh, this book that I have written, I say it took me either four years to write or three decades to write, depending upon how you look at it. Uh, one of the academic institutions that I attended that Samantha did not mention, I attended way too many schools, by the way, um, but one of the ones that she did not mention is uh, my elementary school background. And uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C. I grew up in southeast D.C., east of the Anacostia River, a predominantly black neighborhood. And starting from a very young age, I traveled to way upper northwest Washington uh, in order to attend a school in the most privileged segment of Washington, D.C. And I am very grateful to my parents for having the foresight to make that happen. And the origins of this book really do date to that period in the sense that I had a long journey that involved a bus, two different subway lines, a walk that lasted uh, a little less than a mile, and what do you have to do during that time other than think, why am I doing this journey? Uh, what am I gaining as a result of undergoing this trek? And conversely, what are my neighbors not gaining uh, as a result of going to the local school? And so I remember learning about Brown versus Board of Education in 1985, and that's 31 years after Brown versus Board of Education, but also being aware that within shouting distance of the Supreme Court's Marble Palace, there were still many all-black schools. And that suggested to me that there's often a big gap between law on the books and life on the streets. Um, and so I thought that I was going to be a public school teacher after, as I graduated from Brown University. Uh, I got certified to teach public school uh, through a program at Duke, I taught U.S. history, and I taught civics. And that is, uh, in many ways, an animating force for the book as well, because when I was teaching in high school, I had a vague sense of the constitutional rights that students have within the nation's public schools, but I would have been very hard-pressed to identify, you know, Tinker versus Des Moines, one of the foundational free speech rights cases, or, you know, Goss versus Lopez, a case that deals with due process rights. And so one of the aims of the book is to offer a panoramic view of the whole host of constitutional rights that students have within public schools that they don't have uh, when they are across the school. Um, and so I try to contend in the book that the public school is the single most significant site of constitutional interpretation in the nation's history. Um, I view the book as an examination of the intersection of two vital institutions, the public school on the one hand and the Supreme Court on the other. And I contend that it's difficult, if not impossible, to understand the one institution without thinking about the other. We don't often think about the public school as a legal institution, but it is precisely because the Supreme Court has articulated a whole host of constitutional rights that assume a particular uh, shape within the nation's public schools. So, yeah, as I said, free speech rights, due process rights, equal protection, right, thinking about race, uh, inequality, and also thinking about school financing. Uh, thinking about criminal procedure as well, Fourth Amendment and Fifth Amendment rights, religion. And so when you step back and think about it, there is an entire uh, array of constitutional rights making the public school a legal institution. Conversely, um, it's my claim that it's difficult to understand the Supreme Court's place in American society without putting the education cases at the very center. I contend that the Supreme Court uh, has an, a large role to play in American society and that it has been efficacious in doing so uh, with these education decisions. Uh, many constitutional law professors today take a very anemic view of what the Supreme Court can do. Uh, they think it is a weak and fragile institution, often just simply reflecting the larger trends in American society, marching more or less in lockstep with the American people. That's incorrect in my view. Uh, and I try to identify instances where the Supreme Court has resisted majoritarian impulses in order to vindicate minority rights. Let me give you one example uh, that, that brings home this point quite clearly. 
Um, there's a case called Plyler versus Doe from 1982. That's not a decision that lots and lots of people know about, and I wish that more Americans did. Uh, it's a case that involved a statute out of Texas uh, where it saw the, Texas passed a statute that sought to exclude unauthorized immigrants. And it's an open question at the time as to whether this violates the Constitution. In a five to four decision, the Supreme Court invalidated that measure and says that it does violate the Constitution, that you cannot exclude unauthorized immigrants uh, from the nation's public schools. Some of the, my colleagues in the academy dismiss the importance of Plyler versus Doe and say, well, Texas was the only state in the nation that had this law and therefore, we shouldn't view this as a major intervention on uh, the part of the Supreme Court. Only those yahoos down in Texas would be attracted to such a law. Texas, where I lived for five very happy years, I should say, right? And we know very well today that anxieties about unauthorized immigration are far from confined to Texas. And what the Supreme Court did in this decision was in effect to inter this sort of legislation and prevent it from spreading all across the country. And I found polling data that suggested that a majority of Americans believed that those sorts of laws should be constitutional rather than uh, be unconstitutional. And so you can agree agree with that decision or disagree with that decision, but there's no doubt that it has been efficacious in allowing many children to receive an education who otherwise would have been excluded. Okay, I'm going to talk about three different uh, cases today that I care a lot about uh, in the book and that I hope that you will care about as well. I'm going to talk about the freedom of speech in the nation's public schools. I'm going to talk about the Fourth Amendment in the schools, and then I'm also going to talk about uh, corporal punishment, thinking about the Eighth Amendment in schools. So that's the issue that I care the most about. Um, okay, so free speech. One of the things that I try to do in the book, it's written for a general audience, I should say, by the way. I did not want to publish this book with Harvard University Press. I wanted to publish it in a way that it would be uh, understandable and accessible to non-lawyers. I hope that law professors read it, but I didn't want only law professors to read it. Uh, and so one of the things that jumped out at me as I was researching this material was the tremendous amount of courage that students demonstrated uh, as they sought to vindicate their constitutional rights. And so one of the things I try to do in the book is to shine a spotlight on these courageous students and their families uh, who are standing up not only against school authorities but also their surrounding communities. And that point is uh, in vivid, uh, brought into vivid uh, relief by the Tinker family in the 1960s. Uh, this is Mary Beth Tinker, who I had the privilege of meeting uh, during my book tour, uh, and her older brother John. They are students in Des Moines, Iowa, and in December of 1965, they want to wear black armbands in protest of the Vietnam War. School officials get wind of this, and they say, oh no, that is too hot button of a topic. We had a graduate of Des Moines schools who died over in Vietnam, and he still has buddies who are here. And if you wear these black armbands, they are going to take you as dishonoring his legacy and his memory and his sacrifice. Therefore, you are not allowed to return to school uh, until you agree to shed the black armbands. At the time, again, it's an open question as to whether this would infringe the student's rights. Justice Fortas writes a magnificent opinion that gives me the title for my book. Um, he invalidates the school's actions and says that it violates the student's freedom of speech. And in the passage that gives me my book, he says, it can hardly be argued that students shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. It was an important opinion because he reconceptualized the role of students in American society. Uh, he said that students are not merely empty vessels that teachers are responsible for filling with content. Instead, he said, students exchanging ideas with one another uh, is not some sort of distraction, but instead a vital part of the educational process itself. He says that ours is a relatively open and disputatious society, and it would be odd if our public schools did not feature some of those same disputes. We like to mix it up in the United States. You can hear faint echoes of Tocqueville, right, and the sort of the clamor that defines American society. 
Yeah, uh, there was an important dissenting opinion written by Justice Abe Fortas, as if to exemplify this idea that ours is a disputatious society, Justice Hugo Black spoke from the bench for more than 20 minutes. Uh, you know, usually when justices write dissenting opinions, they just publish the dissent and they don't announce that disagreement from the bench. But Fortas felt sufficient, pardon me, Justice Hugo Black felt sufficiently strongly that he spoke for more than 20 minutes. And he said, I want it known that I disavow every sentence, every word, every part of what the Supreme Court is doing today. He was fairly frothing at the mouth, so much so that Chief Justice Warren is purported to have said old Hugo really got caught up in his jockstrap on that one. And if he did get caught up in his jockstrap, some people have suggested it can, it's, a, it's attributable to something that happened in his personal life. Uh, Justice Hugo Black had a grandson who produced an underground newspaper that was quite critical of school administrators and uh, he was suspended from school. And Justice Black wrote a note to his daughter-in-law saying the school did exactly the right thing here. Students are there to you know, be seen and not heard and you better not make this into a constitutional matter. Our society is too permissive. Society's going to hell in a handbasket, right? Uh, that is an irresistible story and it's one that I tell in my book, uh, but to view Black's descent as merely one grandfather's fit of peak is to misunderstand the decision. It's my claim that Black's view uh, resonated with more Americans than Fortas's view. I found polling data, again, uh, that suggested that a majority of Americans believe that students should not retain constitutional rights of freedom of speech. Indeed, the polling question was phrased at a pretty high level of generality and when they said, should student protesters be able to do their, their demonstrations, surely the first thing that would have sprung to mind would not have been the K through 12 environment, but instead the college campuses, thinking about Mark Rudd and Columbia and Students for a Democratic Society. And if people had doubts about college students being able to do these sorts of protests, then imagine the very sort of weak view that they would have had of uh, the, the rights of public school students. It's worth saying that Black's view has not completely disappeared from American society in a case, uh, or even on the Supreme Court, in a case that was decided when I was a law clerk to Justice Breyer called Morse versus Frederick, Justice Clarence Thomas wrote an opinion that said Hugo Black was exactly right, uh, Tinker was wrongly decided. In the good old days, teachers commanded and students obeyed. Right? Justice Thomas is an originalist. Uh, it's worth noting that his fellow originalist, Justice Scalia, did not join him in that opinion, which raises interesting questions about when originalists are dedicated to vindicating the original public meaning no matter what. I said the case is called Morse versus Frederick. Nobody calls it Morse versus Frederick. Anybody know the name of this case? This is a pop quiz. <laughs> Please. Yeah, exactly right. This a bong hits for Jesus is what everybody calls it, including the law clerks in the building. It's called bong hits for Jesus because a student who was a 12th grader in Juneau, Alaska, unfurled a banner uh, across the street from the school uh, as the Olympic torch made its way down Glacier Avenue in Juneau, Alaska that says bong hits for Jesus. The principal sees the banner, marches right over, snatches it out of his hands, and then proceeds to suspend him. And the question is, does this violate the freedom of speech? Chief Justice Roberts wrote an opinion uh, that is very unusual. He says that if the teacher reasonably believes that the speech in question is designed to promote illicit drug use, then it's permissible to punish the student for the speech. Drugs are a big problem in our society, he says. I say it's unusual because it's a hallmark of the freedom of speech that you're supposed to be viewpoint neutral, right? You're not supposed to silence one side of the debate uh, because in the marketplace of ideas, people will mix it up and the truth will out. Uh, so if you say that uh, anti-drug speech is permissible, then pro-drug speech should also be permissible, but that's not how the court saw it. Uh, 
Just as John Paul Stevens wrote a really terrific dissenting opinion in this case, he, he was quite elderly at the time, um, and he's more elderly still today, I'm happy to report. Uh, but he said, I can remember prohibition from my youth. And why should we not view young Joseph Frederick as attempting to participate, however inarticulately, in a debate about the legalization of marijuana? When, he, when Stevens talks about uh, prohibition, surely he's saying that what is illegal today can become legal tomorrow. And it seems to me that with 11 years have passed since 2007, Stevens' argument assumes only added significance given the transformation of drug laws in uh, at least a few of our states. Uh, so the court did a nice job in Tinker. It didn't go far enough, in my view, for reasons that I can explain in Q&A if you all are interested. Uh, but in recent years, it's fallen down in its responsibility to vindicate student speech rights. The Roberts Court has a much vaunted reputation for being a defender of the freedom of speech. Indeed, many people believe that it's rather too enamored of the freedom of speech, seeing infringements where they don't properly belong. Uh, but this is one area where its sort of uh, defense of freedom of speech is uh, woefully uh, weak, in my view. Okay, that's the freedom of speech. The, the second case I'll talk about is the Fourth Amendment, uh, dealing with searches and seizures. Uh, I talk about a case involving a young student called uh, Lindsey Earls, who grew up in Oklahoma, about 40 miles away from Oklahoma City, a relatively remote part of Oklahoma. And she can recall being in her high school uh, uh, history class and being summoned to the girls' restroom uh, where she is supposed to provide a urine uh, sample. She can recall a teacher being posted outside listening for the telltale sounds of urination. Uh, she can recall a teacher joking about, there were many students along with Lindsay Earls who were there, teachers joking about a potty training exercise that was happening. And when Lindsay Earls exits the stall, she hands the vessel to the teacher who inspects it for warmth and then holds it up to the light for color and clarity to make sure it looks as it should. Why was she required to do this? Because she participated in extracurricular activities. Uh, so this is what we would regard as a suspicionless drug search for her participating in the debate team. And in most areas of the Fourth Amendment, you would regard this as a dragnet search and therefore impermissible. There's no individualized suspicion on wrongdoing on anyone's part. The government, in the form of the public schools, attempting to see what it can find by requiring her to take this uh, drug test. The Supreme Court of the United States upheld this measure and says it doesn't violate the Fourth Amendment, and that decision is mistaken in my view. Okay, the last uh, case that I'll talk about, more or less, at least in any depth, involves the Eighth Amendment. And again, this is the one that I care the most about. It's a case uh, called Ingram versus Wright, and it involves a student named James Ingram, who attended Charles R. Drew Junior High School in Miami, Florida in the 1970s. Another pop quiz. Anybody know who Charles R. Drew is? Yeah, no, he's not, actually, but that's a good guess. Uh, Charles R. Drew is a black scientist who did pioneering work with respect to blood plasma. I learned about him in my uh, schools that I attended in Washington, D.C. There was a lot of emphasis on black excellence. Uh, it was purported, uh, this is apocryphal, that Charles R. Drew, uh, you know, he did die in a car accident. The story that I heard was that he was not admitted to the white hospital where the pioneering technology that he came up with would have saved his life. That's an apocryphal story, but it's a good one. Um, it could have happened. Uh, so I say he went to Charles R. Drew Jr. High School because he is a black man, and white kids didn't go to schools that were named after black kids. So this was an entirely black school uh, that James Ingram went to. James Ingram's on the stage one day at an assembly, 
and he's a little late to depart the stage when he's expected to do so along with some of his classmates. And for that fairly typical you know, adolescence conduct, adolescent conduct, he is summoned to the principal's office where he's supposed to receive five licks in the parlance. Uh, this is blows with a two foot long wooden paddle. And when James Ingram's turn arises, he protests his innocence and two assistant principals go, come over, they hold, one holds down his arms, the other his legs, and they bend him at the waist over the principal's desk. And he receives not five licks, but 20 licks. This beating is so savage that he seeks medical attention and a doctor prescribes pain relievers, cold compresses, sleeping pills, laxatives, he returns to the, receive more medical attention three days after this attack, I think is not too strong a word. And I found a doctor's notes that said that he had a bruise that was six inches in diameter that was purplish, tender, swollen, and also oozing fluid. And this was part of a reign of terror that existed at Charles R. Drew Junior High School where students were beaten for not having the right gym shoes, for sitting in the wrong seat, and sometimes there were just mass paddlings where someone was not suspected of any wrongdoing. You guys are acting up in the corner, that's it, go to the principal's office, you're all going to get some licks. The school district, when they sought to defend this, this regime, ended up making matters worse. There was a student, uh, pardon me, there was a principal at a school in Miami Beach. And he said, we don't use corporal punishment in our schools. We have a mostly Jewish student population and they understand oral persuasion. The implication is that the all black students at Charles R. Drew Junior High School understand only brute force. So you'd be hard pressed to identify a more egregious set of facts uh, that would uh, lead to a challenge under the Eighth Amendment, which says that it prohibits cruel and unusual punishments. Five to four decision, Justice Lewis Powell writes it, and he says that this does not violate the Constitution. Indeed, he says that this doesn't even qualify as punishment for purposes of the Constitution. Punishment under the Eighth Amendment, he says, needs to stem from a criminal conviction and there is no criminal conviction here, therefore there is no constitutional punishment. People were uh, very surprised about this decision because only a few years earlier, what used to be called the strap in prisons was abolished in an opinion for the Eighth Circuit by then Judge Blackman. Justice Blackman, by the way, joins the majority in the Ingram versus Wright decision and does not endeavor to explain. People thought, I think understandably, that if you can't hit people who are in prison who have been convicted of crimes, there is no way in the world you're going to be permitted to hit public school students, but that's not how the Supreme Court saw it. I say that I care the most about this case because it is not merely a historical artifact. Instead, corporal punishment continues to exist in this great nation of ours. Uh, there are now 18 states that still have corporal punishment, but that overstates uh, its prevalence in many respects because just five states account for more than 70% of the instances of corporal punishment. And I am sorry to say that the great state of Arkansas is one of those five states. Typically it's not found in urban areas, it's found in rural areas. And if I have any single goal for this book, it's that it elevates this, the salience of this issue and that it inspires the Supreme Court to revisit it. Um, I say that I want the Supreme Court to revisit it because I fear that the jurisdictions that retain the practice um, will not do it on their own. Okay, so what do we do uh, about these issues? I'm actually, this is a, obviously an incredibly fraught moment in which we find ourselves in the nation. Um, there was a bitter confirmation battle, but I'm hopeful. Uh, about the, the three issues that I identified. Free speech, 
Fourth Amendment, Eighth Amendment. I'm hopeful that we can cobble together a coalition of liberals and libertarians to bring about needed constitutional reforms in this area in the form of their constitutional decision making. If you are a libertarian, you are, have a certain amount of skepticism of state authority and uh, you don't believe that the state is an all-powerful entity. That's the libertarian idea about the freedom of speech, uh, the Fourth Amendment, allowing the government to search your uh, intimate uh, parts of your life is another infraction. And of course the Eighth Amendment seems to me to be uh, the most logical area where libertarians would say this is an impermissible exercise of dominion over individuals uh, in the form of allowing uh, public school students to be hit. The last remaining group in American society uh, that can be struck by governmental officials for you know, failure to follow an order. So uh, even if the Supreme Court of the United States, however, does not act in this area, we should not think that uh, all hope is lost. You could find reform through state legislatures who can pass protective measures, it's important to bear in mind that the Supreme Court of the United States is responsible for passing, uh, for, pardon me, for articulating a constitutional floor below which school districts cannot fall, but nothing prohibits additional layers of protection. And we've seen this dynamic happen uh, where state legislatures have offered additional layers of protection, including in the area of the freedom of speech with respect to student journalists. Uh, there was a case called Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer where the court offered a thin conception of the student journalists' rights and several states passed measures that offered additional layers of protection. A similar dynamic played itself out with respect to state courts interpreting the state constitution. You can think about the San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez decision which dealt with school finance where uh, the Supreme Court of the United States in a five to four decision uh, found that the method of financing schools in Texas and many other states as well through property tax did not violate the Constitution. This is a claim, by the way, that many people thought was a winner when the lawsuit was filed in the 1960s. Uh, President Nixon received four Supreme Court appointments in short order and all four of them joined along with Potter Stewart to say that this doesn't violate the Constitution. Justice. Thurgood Marshall, in his dissenting opinion, perhaps his strongest opinion in all of his time on the court, uh, wrote in his 100th and final footnote, you've lost in the federal courts, but you should turn your attention to state courts interpreting state constitution, many of which have provisions that provide for some sort of educational equity and the state supreme courts have interpreted them in that way. Uh, you know, uh, this is a long process and it often involves the state supreme courts uh, saying that this method is inadequate, take another crack at it, state legislature, so the state legislature is involved there as well. Uh, it takes place over a long period of time, but this has led to relief. In uh, Demetrio Rodriguez was the named litigant in the Rodriguez litigation. He had four children in San Antonio and he grew up in Edgewood, uh, the poor part of town, heavily Latino part of town, not incidentally, uh, in comparison to Alamo Heights, the wealthy part of town. Uh, and in recent years, after the Texas Supreme Court's involvement in this area, there are some years where the students in Edgewood receive more money per pupil than the students in Alamo Heights. Demetrio Rodriguez said in uh, you know, 1989, he said, this is a bittersweet moment for me because I'm really happy that this claim won, but it's too late for my own children to be the beneficiaries of this. So this protracted process led Mark Udoff, a law professor at the University of Texas back in the day, to say that school finance litigation is like a Russian novel. He says, it's long, it's tedious, and everybody dies in the end. <laughs>
The final thing I'd say is that our local school boards can also offer additional layers of protection to students' constitutional rights. And I end the book uh, by saying that it's all of our responsibilities to care about what happens in our nation's public schools, regardless of whether you are a public school student or your own children attend public school or whether you have any children at all. Uh, Justice Jackson wrote an opinion uh, in the Barnett case out of the 1940s. That was a case that involved uh, the, the Pledge of Allegiance, requiring students to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Jehovah's Witness students in the 1940s said it violated their religious faith. Jackson writes a magnificent opinion uh, where he says that this is impermissible and it's a violation of their free speech rights. It was initially understood as a religion claim, but he said, no, this is speech. The right to speak involves a corollary right not to speak, he says. And so this is a prohibition on compulsory speech. It's an, such an important opinion, it, it contains a couple of lines I'll share with you before I close. One is he says, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it's that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox. All right, it's a beautiful sentence, and it suggests that, uh, you know, if there's anything that we're committed to, uh, that no one can tell you what you have to do. And by saying if there's any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, some people have suggested that he's almost appealing to our sense of patriotism, thinking about the American flag itself. The last quotation that I'll leave you with is also from Justice Jackson, where uh, there was a decision that went the other way three years earlier. And uh, that is to say, it said that it was permissible to exclude Jehovah's Witnesses for refusing to salute the American flag. And the thrust of that opinion, the Gobitis decision written by Justice Frankfurter, um, was that he said, uh, Justice Frankfurter said, uh, you know, we are judges, we are not teachers, and we cannot become a school board for the nation. And Justice Jackson said, nonsense. Uh, Justice Jackson insisted that the schoolhouse is an especially vital arena to protect constitutional rights. Because if we don't, Justice Jackson said, uh, we risk teaching children that our founding document contains mere platitudes, and we risk strangling the free mind at its source, he says. So Justice Jackson said it much better than I could. Thank you, and now I look forward to your questions. Great job. All right, yes, we've got questions, then let's, uh, we'll, we'll, where's the microphone back here? Bob, just, you got people all around you. I should say I welcome questions, comments, objections. You know, you tell me how I've got it wrong. I want to I wanna hear what you all have to say. All right, let, and let's try to keep our questions short, because we've got a lot of people asking questions, okay? So, short questions. Thank, thanks for coming tonight. I, I, obviously, the, the, the role of the courts has been tried, has tried to, uh, create a, some quest for justice and hope and humanity in our schools. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about two books as I reflect on your, uh, your presentation. One is Stephen Jay Gould's The Mismeasure of Man, and then next is Jonathan Kozel's Savage Inequalities. And I raise those connections because of the, the fulcrum of equity is, in my view, based on this false assumption that psychometrics test can determine the future of our children. And now we see public policy that's guiding that. We see public policy that's guiding funding cases and equity in funding. Kozel argued that this was ripe for the kind of federal constitutional inquiry that I suspect you might agree with. I don't know. But I'm deeply worried that, we, and, and you know, you teach at a place that's in the shadows of John Dewey, who argued that this ought to be fundamentally focused on democratic participation and making. And as Mike Rowe says, deepening how we define intelligence, performance, and judgment rather than the psychometric, I think, proto-fascism. So I, I wonder if you might talk about the constitutional, the fairness, the equity issues associated with using psychometrics and this flawed judgment-making that we use to, to sort of determine equity. Yeah. 
It's a really interesting question. Both of the books that you mentioned I read when I was a young man, uh, when I was a student at Brown University, and they both meant a lot to me, actually. The uh, Savage Inequalities uh, was foundational for me. Uh, I share many of the concerns that you identify, including the role of testing that uh, plays an enormous role in our uh, society. One thing I didn't speak about at all is the phenomen of, phenomenon of tracking, where you know the schools that I went to in Washington, D.C., the public school that I went to for junior high school was a heavily black school. Uh, there were some white kids there, and I was often the only black kid in the accelerated classes. Uh, and so that happened through the it, 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 sort of paying attention to the test, these things that theoretically reveal, uh, you know, our abilities and, uh, you know, uh, many people would, uh, with Gould, uh, tie that to innate cognitive capacity rather than simple, uh, sim simple uh, uh, ability and everything. So I share those concerns. I'm not sure how large a role I think that the Constitution of the United States has to play. I am a Constitution lawyer, that's my primary hat. Uh, but I think it's a matter of real concern and there you could imagine some claims including along the racial dimensions uh, that I'm identifying here. You could imagine if the tracking were sufficiently stark, perhaps even the sort of tracking that I endured, that that would rise to the level of an equal protection clause claim. Uh, and, and J. Skelly Wright, a mighty judge on the D.C. Circuit, wrote an opinion in a case called Hobson versus Hansen uh, that had a little flavor of that back in the uh, the 1960s. All right, sir. Yeah, here's a question, right? Okay, you got one. Okay. Thanks for being here. Um, your, um, um, the Tinker decision, you know, talks not just about student rights, but also about teachers' rights uh, not ending at the schoolhouse mm -hmm. uh, gate, which is, I think, often, often downplayed a bit. Uh -huh. Could you talk a bit about your perception of the health of, of teachers' constitutional rights um, in schools uh, today? Uh, not good, it would be the short answer. I think you're exactly right. Uh, I made an elision, uh, and I do focus, I should say, in the book overwhelmingly on students' rights rather than teachers' rights. They were better back in the day as a result of the Pickering decision, uh, and now there's a public employee speech case called Garcetti versus Ceballos, which uh, made it a lot more difficult on that front. And I have spoken to a couple of teacher groups that have uh, expressed real frustration uh, with the state of affairs. That is to say that they want to be able to talk about uh, politics on uh, social media and you know their political engagement. And uh, there are some school districts, at least, that make that difficult to happen. And I find that uh, you know distressing. Um, you know, I think the Tinker decision was a wonderful one. In my view, it didn't go nearly far enough. The test that Tinker announced was that if there's a reasonable forecast of a substantial disruption, then it's permissible to punish the students and the teachers, uh, presumably, for the speech. The problem with that is that it reads into the test what can be regarded as a heckler's veto. This is an idea that my predecessor at the University of Chicago, Harry Calvin, came up with. And by that he meant, with the heckler's veto, sensitive speakers can, if they object vociferously enough, shut down otherwise legitimate speech. And that happens in our schools today, where there are cases involving students who wish to wear the American flag. Uh, and are told they have to wear clothing featuring the American flag, and they're told they have to turn the T-shirts inside out. Why? Because it's May the 5th, a.k.a. Cinco de Mayo, and students say, what's the matter? You don't like Mexicans? They view wearing the American flag as a provocation. And while I understand uh, the frustration with the students, I don't think that it should be legitimate to tell people to wear clothing featuring the American flag inside out. Uh, the, the students who are threatening violence uh, should be spoken to, and if anyone's going to be punished, I would say it's the students who are threatening violence in that way. The same analysis applies uh, to uh, students who wish to express anti-gay sentiments. One of the cases that I write about is one out of California where on a day of silence, uh, 
a student wants to wear a t-shirt to school, a homemade t-shirt that says, do not accept what God has condemned, and he cites Romans 127, and the school told him he couldn't wear it, uh, and told him that he, could, he was unwelcome to wear it. Now, I despise that speech, and I know that our gay brothers and sisters suffer as a result of such, uh, as a result of such speech. Nevertheless, if I'm serious about being viewpoint neutral, uh, then I want to think about what would be possible uh, for this student to express his views uh, about this debate. There's no doubt in my mind that this young man was in a similar position in many respects to Mary Beth Tinker in the 1960s. That is to say, he's trying to express an unpopular viewpoint, and those students in Des Moines, Iowa, were also trying to express an unpopular viewpoint. And I, for one, could not envision a t-shirt expressing these views in a way that would not have run afoul of the school's censorship. Uh, his message was not straight pride, right? Uh, which some people have suggested is an alternative, his message was homosexuality as a sin. Again, I despise that message, uh, but uh, our constitutional tradition is to give uh, students included uh, reasonably robust constitutional protections. Yes, we've got a question right here. Right here, Bob. Thank you so much for coming. As a constitutional lawyer, could I ask uh, a personal opinion? Um, Cases come through, as you mentioned, state supreme courts and uh, the the district courts. Are we losing uh, originalist and literalist viewpoints in that uh, process? Hmm. Uh, you know, originalism is uh, an incredibly influential, uh, you know, mode of constitutional interpretation and an ascendant one within the legal academy as well. Uh, I have a colleague who self-identifies as an originalist, and that would not have happened even sort of 25 years ago or, you know, in, in many places. Uh, you know, textualism is a cousin to originalism, and both of these ideas can be traced to justice scholarship. Scalia. I think that Justice Scalia was the most influential Supreme Court justice of the last 50 years. I said that when I was a visiting professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, they thought I meant it as, as praise. You know, I did not mean it as praise. Uh, I meant it as a descriptive claim. Uh, but he is incredibly influential. I do think he's more influential when it comes to textualism rather than originalism. Textualism going to the interpretation of statutes uh, rather than to constitutional interpretation. The truth of the matter is it's very hard to be an originalist on the lower courts. And I, perhaps I hear that's where your question is coming from, uh, which requires a tremendous it requires a tremendous amount of work. It's much easier to be an originalist at the Supreme Court of the United States where they're only hearing 70 cases or so a year and they have the benefit of an enormous amount of briefing where people are willing to uncover these, uh, these original understanding. Originalism doesn't carry you very far for these cases that I write about at all. And of course, Brown versus Board of Education, which I neglected to mention in my remarks, is uh, almost uh, an anti-originalist opinion, right? We cannot turn back the clock to 1868 or to 1896, Chief Justice Warren writes. Right? He talks about the rising importance of public education in our schools, but he's not trying to uncover originalism with any real vigor. Uh, so it's interesting to think about that opinion, which is the most sacrosanct in our constitutional canon, uh, and how that sits alongside the ascendant view of originalism. Questions? Thank you again for coming. A quick question about your Eighth Amendment, the corporal punishment. As you were talking about, I was thinking, maybe even if the Eighth Amendment doesn't apply, what about the 14th? What about equal protection and due process arguments there? It seems like there was pretty massive inequality in the way punishment was done in that Florida district. Yeah, it's a really good question. You're thinking about it from the perspective of the equal protection clause, I hear you, with respect to the 14th Amendment. There uh, was a due process clause claim, and you mentioned that as well, in the case itself. And uh, many people thought that would be a winner in 1977 at the time of Ingram because uh, two years earlier, there's a case called Goss versus Lopez, which says that students, before they are suspended, have a, some certain procedural rights. They can 
notice of the charge against them in effect, to use a criminal term, and an opportunity to be heard, right? It's pretty informal, but it's something. The Supreme Court of the United States said in Ingram, no, there are no due process rights. If you uh, are hit sufficiently savagely, then you turn your attention to state courts and maybe you're able to get damages, uh, finance, compensatory damages. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, a bell cannot be unrung uh, and a bottom cannot be unpaddled, right? Uh, and so many people would say, of course, there's a claim here. So I am hopeful that this is going to be challenged. I have reason to believe that uh, corporal punishment is going to be challenged. You gesture toward this idea of race. Um, in racial inequality, and we should say that their uh, race, that is say black and brown children receive a disproportionate share of corporal punishment in the United States, and that's true, even accounting for the fact that the states that retain corporal punishment are uh, disproportionately black. Um, so you shouldn't pay attention to the whole nation, you want to pay attention to the uh, enrollment uh, by race in the places that practice corporal punishment. I am also very sorry to say uh, you, well, I'm happy to say you can find very few people who defend corporal punishment, right? This is not something that people are writing and saying is a good idea. There are lots of studies that say this is a horrific idea. It suggests that violence is the solution to problems. Some of the few people who are willing to defend corporal punishment are black folks uh, who defend the practice on grounds of racial autonomy. And so what springs to mind is sometimes, and this does exist, I write about a young uh, man in Dallas, Texas in 1971, who was one of the first people to integrate a school in Dallas, Texas, and the white teacher says, here comes fresh meat, and you know, he received, this black student received an unbelievably, uh, his name was Terry Collins. Uh, he, got a un he got an unbelievably tough time of it. I I'm not sure that that's the dominant mode. I fear that it's often black instructors who are striking black students in these rural areas, and they defend it, and they say, this is grounds of racial autonomy, how dare you come to our school and tell us we are raising our children how we see fit. I don't find those arguments persuasive, uh, but, but those are the folks who are defending it, at least uh, on, on the merits. Not only, but often. Okay. Thank you again for coming. Uh, my question is this, as a professor, um, do you have notes or an outline for those of us who teach debates and we use the Constitution for middle school and high school students for that? Uh, it's called my book. Uh, you know, <laughs> available right over here. A wonderful stocking stuffer. It's that time of year. Um, no, it, it, I, I joke. Uh, uh, but I did write the book in a way to be accessible to teachers and to high school students. And one of the most heartening things for me as a result of trying to promote this book was I was interviewed by a young woman called Anna Salvatore from New Jersey. And she was a, she's a high school junior, and she read this, you know, uh, fairly long book and had unbelievably cogent questions and commentary. She runs a high school, she runs a, she runs a website called High School SCOTUS. Uh, so she's a really remarkable young uh, woman, and so I don't suggest that every high school student is going to curl up with my 576-page book, uh, but there are a few out there, and I do hope that uh, it tees up the issues, because one of the goals I have for the book is to increase civic awareness. You know, my old boss, Justice O'Connor, uh, after she departed the court, she focused her attention on civics education. She was disheartened about the way that many people are, uh, many of our students don't know basic ideas about our founding document, document, including the separation of powers. I feel my book is trying to carry on her tradition with the idea that the separation of powers might be a bit abstract if you're an 11th grader, uh, but students, are, are aware that they may have some rights and they also, importantly, have a keen sense of injustice. And so by talking about rights in a context that they know very well, my hope is that this will offer as like sort of a gateway to the Constitution as a whole. If we begin with the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment, it's at least possible that this will spark uh, an interest in, in, in constitutional law. Final question here, Dean. We've got two more. We'll, give more. we'll get superintendent here. This, this is uh, John DePippa, the dean of the 
University of Arkansas Bowen School of Law. So he, he may come at you there, Justin. Yes. <laughs> Former dean. Always a dean. Um, I just have a general question. Do you believe that the rights of elementary and secondary students, free speech rights, should be identical to adult free speech rights outside of the school context? It's a terrific question. Uh, thank you, Dean. Um, so my answer to that question is no. And uh, I, I might even reformulate the question ever so slightly, actually, with your permission. Um, I would say, should students' rights within the school be identical to minors' free speech rights when they are outside of school? Because generally speaking, we don't draw distinctions between what minors can say and what people who have reached the age of majority can say. One of the few exceptions in this area would be the variable obscenity statutes going to pornography, but that's a very unusual thing. Students, 15-year-old kids can say in the public park what somebody who's 35 can say, and we don't draw distinctions between those things. Um, but nevertheless, my answer to that question is no. I don't think that minors' rights outside uh, in the public park should be identical as with respect to the public school. And so one area uh, that I would be sympathetic to a beefed up doctrine would be with respect to fighting words. So, uh, you know, and one of the reasons that I believe in a beefed up fighting words doctrine in schools, which would be roughly a prohibition on racial epithets, Right. If the person I talked about out in California wanted to use the word uh, faggot, that would be a bridge too far for me, and I would not think it's uh, a violation of his free speech rights to say that that T-shirt would be impermissible, and you could add many other words besides, of course. Um, one of the reasons that I would want that is that uh, we are dealing with a captive audience in the schools, whereas if you're in a public park across the street afterward, you can disengage. A second reason that I do want to be sympathetic to the school setting is uh, I do think about neuroscience as well. And the Supreme Court of the United States has in recent years in the criminal context uh, paid attention to the developing adolescent brain. Um, and uh, they've relied on a very important psychologist called Lawrence Steinberg. And he came up with an ingenious metaphor where he says that the adolescent brain uh, is like a car that is equipped with a really sensitive gas pedal and really terrible brakes, right? Fast to make decisions and to get hot, right? And very slow to slow, slow down and everything, right? Uh, so that's, that's, that, that made a deep impression on me, and that's why I would want uh, this. You can use the word uh, faggot, unfortunately, I shouldn't say unfortunately, the Supreme Court of the United States in a case called Westboro Baptist Church, right, Snyder versus Phelps, offered incredibly robust protection where people were saying, thank God for dead fags and fag soldiers and all these sort of things, right? And so uh, I don't want that to be in the school. Uh, you know, I don't want that sort of language to be in the school. Uh, but I do think that we need to contemplate uh, what's happening in schools and the way that student speech rights are being drained. And the final thing I'll say is there's been a tremendous amount of attention that has been paid to uh, sort of speech issues on college campuses around the country, right? You all have read about the sort of confrontations that happen when a particular speaker is invited. Too little attention has been paid to what's happening in our K through 12 environment. It's my claim that there's an important connection between what's happening on college campuses and what's happening in our high school. So if we expected people to uh, be a bit more hardy in putting up with speech that they disagreed with in our K through 12 public schools, I think that we would have uh, better protections for uh, uh, you know, speakers on college campuses as well. Okay. This is the uh, superintendent of the Little Rock Public Schools, Michael Poor. Okay. Uh, good evening. Thank you for uh, being here in our city. Um, you know, one of the things that impacts my life in a pretty substantial way right now is uh, lawsuits uh, coming at us with exceptional children. Mm. And, and I wondered if you might be willing to touch on that a little bit because it, it seems like we've kind of gone from a place where, you know, many families didn't have the level of support to now there's almost an extreme mm. requirement or push for public schools. 
and where do you see that heading? And then if I could take advantage, since I get to be the last question, yeah. if, what's one Supreme Court case that's out there right now that we all ought to know about and pay attention to that's going to evolve that deals with public schools? Terrific. Uh, I'm going to be very short on the first, uh, and I'll be a little longer on the second. The, the first, uh, you're referring to uh, the IDEA, in effect, right? Uh, uh, and um, I don't have that much to say about it. It's an incredibly important area of law. Uh, many of the education cases that are being decided these days are through uh, that statute and that question of statutory interpretation. I do identify as a constitutional law professor rather than someone who's thinking about you know, these statutes. So I don't talk about Title IX with very much specificity or the IDEA. There are other books out there that I can recommend that treat that subject in full. Um, and I was trying to do something you know, new here. Um, with respect to what's percolating, um, I guess I would identify uh, two subjects that could be percolating. Um, we could see the Plyler versus Doe decision be revisited when Chief Justice Roberts was a young attorney working in the Reagan Department of Justice. He co-authored a memorandum suggesting that Plyler versus Doe was wrongly decided. Uh, and if he continues to believe that today, I could quite easily imagine that uh, precedent being thrown out. That was, of course, the uh, prohibition on uh, educate or permitting schools to exclude unauthorized immigrants. Um, so that's one that gives me some heartburn that I'm fearing. Um, another issue to keep an eye on, and I'm sure you, I suspect that you have some experience on this front, is thinking about transgender students and access to restrooms. The Supreme Court of the United States agreed to hear a case involving Gavin Grimm, um, a student in Tidewater, Virginia. And uh, it the, the Fourth Circuit relied on the Obama administration's interpretation of Title IX. And the Trump administration rescinded that guidance. And so the Supreme Court of the United States decided not to decide that issue. Um, and sent it back to the lower courts. Some lower court decisions are relying not on Title IX, but instead on the Equal Protection Clause, including Judge Mark Hornack in the, of the Western District of Pennsylvania, who issued a decision saying that students need to be able to access restrooms that are congruent with their gender identities. One of the interesting things about this area is that there are students uh, sort of, uh, and maybe their parents, importantly, on all sides, where some students are saying, we're trans and we want to be able to go to re with the restroom uh, with people who look like us. And conversely, others are filing lawsuits that say, we are students and we don't want to use the restrooms with the trans students. Um, and so both types of cases are percolating in the lower courts, and I think it's only a matter of time before the Supreme Court of the United States will get involved in this issue. And it's possible uh, that Justice Kennedy would have been more receptive to this sort of claim on behalf of trans students than his successor, uh, you know, his former law clerk, Kavanaugh. Uh, Justice Kennedy was the most vocal proponent of gay equality in the Supreme Court's history. He wrote the Obergefell decision, Romer, many others. Uh, we have no reason to believe that Kavanaugh is uh, going to see things in that same way. And so that's an interesting question. Sometimes we have a temptation to believe almost a Whiggish narrative about the Supreme Court marching with the enlightened American people. Things are getting better and better. It's possible that had the same-sex marriage litigation not been filed when it was, uh, that th those rights would not have been recognized for a long time to come. Well, let's thank Justin in the schoolhouse gate. And as he said, please come visit with him. Science a great stocking stuffer, quoting his words. Thank you all for coming and come visit. Thank you very much.